to uh, take note of um, next week and then the week after. You'll advance to the next one. Um, these are the Zoom controls. If you've been on before, you're quite familiar with this. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I will try to answer to the best of my abilities as we go. Next. Um, as always, please complete the survey. Um, the link will be sent to you uh, in an email after the webinar is complete. We uh, take these uh, your responses to help us uh, next year. So please fill it out. Next. All right. All right. I'll, I'll, I, uh, I am pleased to introduce Andrew Thostenson, our pesticide program specialist for the NDSU Extension Service. And as you might have seen, Andrew is coming to us today from the University of Arkansas. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Uh... Mary Poling here is the uh, uh, guru of the Zoom, and uh, and also uh, my wife Gail Dostinson is here, and um, it's going to be interesting because we get a little bit further on in the presentation. I'll make some comments about um, how she uh, played a role in some of the work that we've done on minimizing pesticide exposure. So uh, we'll get right after it. First off, whenever we talk about pesticides, uh, we, you know, we can easily get, um, you know, sidetracked into a lot of different issues. So I wanted to at least uh, talk about the things that we aren't going to talk about and then spend some time talking about what I am going to talk about and then we'll get after it. Um, there, there are a lot of uh, debate out there about the relative safety or or the non-safety of pesticides, and whether or not they, they cause problems with um, the environment. And some people have a worldview in terms of uh, uh, convictions that you know we either shouldn't or should be using pesticides. So I'm not going to get into that discussion. The other thing is is some some people have. Um, big enthusiasm for organic foods, which are, in theory are raised without certain pesticides. But, um, you know, I, I'm not going to go there today. And so uh, we're going to try and focus in on some of these sorts of issues. Um, the, we, we are going to discuss the necessity for using pesticides properly. Uh, bottom line, if we use pesticides properly, it will help to reduce or minimize any kind of adverse impacts on the environment and, and certainly on reducing uh, human exposure uh, to pesticides and, and the absolute necessity for following label instructions. And I have a picture of uh, um, my family uh, when I was a little bit younger and my hair had more color and I was perhaps a little bit thinner. Uh, my son is since 24 years old on the right, and my daughter is now 21, and they're all grown up. And my reason for, for sharing that with you is, is that I've been involved in pesticides. Looks like we, um, I've been involved in pesticides for uh, 22 years in my position at NDSU. And my children have um, been raised in an environment where pesticides was always something that was talked about or discussed and sometimes used in, in our home and in our garden. The upshot of it is, is, is that uh, by the time they became high school and into early college, both of them uh, participate in the applications of pesticides uh, as part of their summer uh, employment. My son worked in mosquito control for six summers in a row, and uh, my daughter spent two years working with the NDSU weed science program. So they always have worked around pesticides. And the, my reason for bringing this up is, is that I just want you to know that as long as we um, follow the pesticide label instructions as best we can, um, I don't think that the risks are such um, that people are going to be hurt or adversely impacted. And I just want you to know that I definitely would not allow my children to participate in 
those sorts of activities if I thought that it was going to be an adverse situation. So enough of the preliminaries. Let me see if I can't go to the next slide. Here we go. Andrew, I'm going to tell you that we lost your sh your screen is not sharing. Okay. Oh. It said your account needed some annotation updates. Okay. Go to alt. Let's go. What do we go, do? Go down here. Oh. Hmm. Oh, you I got cooking here. Hang on. That's why we have smart people here. I'm not sure what that did. What happened there? So let's try it again. Hang on. How about it now, Stacey? Wait a minute. Oh. Okay. Um, you, you've dis um, Stacy, you've disabled him the ability to participate screen share. So you need to go to part, uh, host part, manage participants and mm -hmm. go to more and yep. give, okay, allow, yep. okay, we good? And make, make host. That's no. the only. Just share screen. Okay, yep, go, and ahead, I, go ahead and make him co-host. Can you make him co-host? I can't make him co-host, but okay. he's now the host. Your, your license must be different than ours. Yeah, so let's fine. try this. Okay. So, um, yeah, that way we're going to do it like this. So if you see somebody come in, then you'll know, cause you're the only one who can mute him cause she won't be able to mute. All right, Stacy, can, can do we need to go back a slide or two? Are we good? Yep. I can see you now. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about just a handful of tips for using pesticides appropriately. And I just want you to know that, my focus with the university is to train professional applicators as well as farmers and ranchers on how to use pesticides appropriately. I, I'm moonlighting now as I talk about things from a homeowner's perspective, but there are a great deal of tips that I've learned over the years. And plus, I use these things uh, around our home. So uh, a lot of these things I have firsthand experience with. So why do we use pesticides in the first place? It's, it's, it seems rather obvious. We are trying to control or kill some sort of pest, whether it's a, an insect and we'll use an insecticide, or we're trying to control or kill weeds and we're using a herbicide, or whether we're trying to uh, control a fungal plant disease. Uh, pesticides are used to control or actually kill pests. The bad part of that is, is that pesticides can also kill things that we don't necessarily want to kill, uh, or they can have adverse consequences on those things. And one of them are just things like honeybees. Um, these are beneficial insects. We don't uh, necessarily want to go out of our way to, to harm these creatures. And they do provide a really important uh, function in some of our uh, uh, food production and, and in the ecology of these sorts of things. Just uh, want to talk a little bit about pesticide drift and in, in, not only are we concerned about harming uh, creatures like uh, bees and other beneficial insects, but when we make a pesticide application, they can also go to a place that we don't want them to go. Um, you know, we may well be interested in trying to control uh, a weed, but we don't necessarily want to take out our shrubberies or our ornamental plants. And this is an example of a plant that's been adversely impacted by off-target movement of spray drift. We also want to be concerned about things like deer and uh, maybe you know, if you're up in Fargo, maybe you really like the bunnies in, in your backyard. Um, I don't know. Some people don't have real great enthusiasm, but we don't want to necessarily hurt um, off-target things uh, like deer and, and other, and, and the, the family dog, the neighbors' dogs or cats, those sorts of things. And obviously, we don't want to harm humans, and especially our little kids. And we don't necessarily want them to be running across the lawn that we've recently treated with a pesticide, especially when they're not wearing any shoes or socks. 
So um, pesticides do have a downside risk, and we have to understand that and appreciate that so that uh, however you attack the whole pesticide thing, when you have made that decision that you are going to use a pesticide to control or kill some sort of pest, we have to just follow some basic safety procedures. The first one is, is uh, just a plain dressing for success. I mean, uh, I, I can't emphasize enough the necessity for not being out there with shorts and flip flops, uh, a tank top shirt, um, or you know, a bathing suit. I've, I've seen everything. Um, we need to uh, wear clothes that are appropriate for the job that we're trying to accomplish. Now, how are we going to know that? And, and the first way that we're going to attack that is, is we're going to get some instructions. And we're going to go to the product label that is found on uh, the product that we've purchased and it's gonna give us instructions about the sorts of things that we need to wear and the sorts of uh, ways in which we need to protect our body from exposure to pesticides. Now, I just wanna make a couple of comments about this, and, and that is, is that most pesticides only require a long sleeve shirt, a long pants, shoes, and socks, and uh, sometimes a, a hat or something to to cover up some of it. Um, and then uh, uh, the oftentimes there will be some comments in there about gloves. The gloves aren't necessarily on par with the ones you see here in the screen, but it is something that you're going to need to look at the label for, for instructions. Now, when part and parcel to reading the pesticide label, all of the instructions for using that product um, to minimize risk to the user, to the environment, to the food uh, plants that you're working with, to the shrubberies, all of those sorts of things are gonna be found on the product label. Now, first and foremost, before you even get to the directions for use, you're gonna find information on what sorts of clothing you need to wear, do you need eye protection, how serious is the glove protection that you need, uh, all of those sorts of things are going to be found on the pesticide label as well as directions for use. The other high point is there's going to be a very uh, serious and frank conversation with you about those sorts of precautions you need to take in order to have adverse effects uh, uh, minimized. So they'll say, hey, if you swallow this, it's not going to be good for you. Uh, you need to be wearing some sorts of eye protection so that you don't um, get this in your eye. You need to keep it off your skin. And then there's going to be a section in there about first aid statements, and the first aid statements will give you information necessary in case, heaven forbid, you do get this stuff on your skin or you do get this stuff on your eye. And if it's serious enough that you need to seek out some medical attention to, uh, to take care of it. The second tip that I wanna put in front of you is this idea that whenever you're spraying pesticides, obviously we wanna kill the pests or control the pests, but we don't want that pesticide going to a sensitive area or a sensitive site, a place where people or animals or uh, honeybees are. Um, all of those things are what we consider sensitive site. You need to really do an evaluation around your yard and think very seriously about the sorts of things that you need to avoid in terms of getting that spray onto those particular locations. And that can be anything from other uh, garden plants, uh, different sensitive species in your garden, um, to um, um, you know, keeping it away from um, uh, food areas, your picnicking areas that you may have in your backyard or on your patio. All of those sorts of things are part of just getting a situational awareness so you know those sorts of places that you want to avoid and protecting those sensitive sites. So sensitive sites include a couple of other really important things. Obviously, different plants may react 
very, very badly or adversely to uh, pesticides getting on them. And one of them can be food crops and things like grapes. So we have some herbicides that are extraordinarily biologically active against grapes. And if we're trying to raise grapes, we don't want those grapes to be damaged by the pesticide that we're using. The other thing are things like water, uh, protecting the groundwater, protecting surface water. So if we have a creek in the backyard or if we have um, a pond in the backyard, those sorts of things we need to be very concerned about avoiding getting that pesticide into those particular areas. And you're gonna find information on the pesticide label that will clue you in about how sensitive those sites may be to that particular pesticide. Now, obviously, uh, once we find um, the sensitive sites and kind of do a site assessment, then we need to, and I know this sounds really elementary, we need to know which way that wind is blowing so that when we make those pesticide applications, it's not going to go in the place that we don't want it to go. So you kind of need to know which way that wind is blowing. There are a lot of different ways uh, to know that. Uh, we don't want people to be spraying when the wind speeds are rather excessive. Each pesticide label will make it clear how much wind speed can be tolerated. As a general rule of thumb, we don't like to be spraying when wind speeds get above 10 miles per hour. Um, but it, it can vary depending on the pesticide and the pesticide label. The other thing is, is obviously if you have a two or three mile per hour wind and you're spraying um, uh, 2,4-D or Trimac or something on your uh, yard to control dandelions and you have tomato plants that are a foot or two away and the wind is blowing towards them, two or three miles per hour is too windy uh, when that wind is blowing towards those tomatoes. So you need to not spray when the wind speeds get excessive and you need to make sure that that wind is not moving in the wrong direction. There are a lot of different ways to determine wind speed. There are apps available uh, on the internet which will give you information about wind speeds in your zip codes. These will help get you on the map. Um, I'm not going to get into great detail on measuring wind speeds, but you need to be mindful of that, and especially when wind speeds get approaching 10 miles per hour, you need to be very concerned about making applications on days like that. We're getting right down to it. And one of the things that we want to do whenever we're applying the pesticides is we want to keep that nozzle uh, no higher than it actually has to be to get the job done. And uh, if we're using certain small lawn, uh, lawn sprayers, uh, the nozzles are designed to create a certain pattern on the lawn. And we don't want those nozzles to be spraying any higher than necessary. And a lot of times that information is not only going to be found on the pesticide label, but it will also be found on the manufacturer of the equipment that you're working with. Now, I know many of you will be using handheld sprayers, and that's just fine. But it also means that you need to keep that uh, wand down and keep that uh, spray equipment down so that you're not uh, getting that uh, spray up into the wind and move to a place that you don't want it to go. Uh, so, uh, having that nozzle set too high or not keeping it uh, down low, close to the target, is not going to be a good thing. Um, obviously, we're concerned about sensitive areas, and we may not get the coverage that we want. So, uh, we may not get the efficiency or the effectiveness if we uh, uh, don't pay attention to those sorts of things. Finally, the last thing I just want to leave with you is this notion that um, in general, and I say this in a, in a very generic way, lower spray pressures will create fewer fine spray drops. And those, those fine spray drops are the ones that are easily carried in the wind and move to the wrong place. And so we don't want to be excessive in our uh, spray pressures. Uh, kind of as a rule of thumb, you can usually, with a small boom sprayer, get an acceptable pattern with uh, spray pressures between about 25 and 35 um, PSI. But once you start getting above those numbers, 
uh, you're going to generate a lot of fine spray drops and those will be subjected uh, to wind and the off target movement uh, of your pesticide spray application. Like I said, I am not going to get into all the details associated with this, but I want to leave you with a couple of uh, resources that I think that you can certainly make good use of. My friend, uh, Carol uh, Ramsey Black with Washington State University put together a couple of video presentations of going on 15 years ago. And they're older video clips, but um, they are still outstanding in terms of covering the waterfront on pesticide safety for homeowners. Uh, there you have the URL, uh, it's tinyurl.com forward slash homeowner pesticide. Um, and another thing is, is if you just want to type in Washington State University Homeowner's Guide to Pesticide Safety and YouTube, you'll probably come to Carol's video clip. This is about 22, 23 minutes, and I definitely think it's worth a look. Uh, for those of you who want to get a little bit deeper and you want to uh, implement certain control strategies that avoid or minimize the use of pesticides, I would invite you to go to Carol Black's companion video clip, The Homeowner's Guide to Integrated Pest Management. And that can be found at tinyurl.com, homeowner IPN. So if you just go to Google, type in Homeowner Guide to Integrated Pest Management, uh, Washington State University should be able to find it. It too is about 20 or 22 minutes long. Uh, both of them are outstanding video clips and I definitely think that it's worth the time and effort to go through those um, before you start uh, tuning up and gearing up to use pesticides this spring. So when you're done using these pesticides, I think the thing that is absolutely critical is, is that you need to clean up. When you're done using pesticides, I want to see you get into a shower situation and I want you to get out of those clothes that are potentially contaminated with pesticides. And I want those clothes to, to be taken care of appropriately and washed appropriately. So, Getting out of those clothes is absolutely critical. Uh, I think the most important thing in terms of keeping yourself uh, in good health and not suffering adverse consequences of pesticides is to, uh, you know, shower and clean up as soon as you can, get into some fresh clothes. I think of all the things that I tell my professional applicators and I'm telling you folks, uh, clean, cleanliness is absolutely critical and uh, proper maintenance of, of hygiene after a pesticide application has got to be paramount in your thinking. So now we're gonna shift gears and I talked a little bit about a handful of pesticide related safety issues and gave you some resources. But now I just want to talk about a subject that has been kind of, uh, I don't know, near and dear to my heart, but also to my family. My wife Gail is here, and about six or seven years ago, my son came home uh, after working a long day in pesticide control, uh, controlling mosquitoes, and he had pesticides on his clothes. And uh, Gail said, you know, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to handle this? And unfortunately, most of the information that we had and the advice that I had to give her was really quite spotty and not really very helpful. And so not only was Gail concerned about this, but uh, my bosses were. And we had people in the family and consumer science group at North Dakota State that said, you know, we need to update this stuff. And so I, I brought a bunch of my colleagues together and we talked about how do we actually launder pesticide contaminated work clothes, especially in light of the fact that most all of the research in this area was done many, many years ago. 
So that's the publication, and I believe Stacy and them sent out information on how to uh, make that available to you as a download in Adobe Acrobat file. It's on the NDSU website, and I have more to say about that in a little bit. So the first thing that we need to know is, is that our work clothing, the stuff that we are wearing when we go out there to do a spray job, in, in effect is your personal protective equipment. That's your clothes are designed to intercept any kind of pesticides that uh, may get onto your skin. And, you know, just simply putting on a shirt, putting on a pair of pants, a hat, um, gloves if necessary, as well as shoes and socks, is about 90% of the PPE that we have out there. Now, personal protective equipment can get very, very elaborate. And some people really want to dress up. And I understand that there's a certain element of fear associated with these pesticides. And I just want to caution you that if you decide that you are going to wear way more uh, clothing than what is uh, prescribed on the pesticide label, that you may well put yourself in a hazardous health situation by uh, getting heat stress or heat stroke. So uh, if you want to wear more personal protective equipment when you uh, work with pesticides, I'm okay, as long as you understand that uh, dressing up a little bit too intensely may have just as many adverse uh, effects as not wearing enough clothing. Uh, the other thing is, is that some pesticide labels, um, you know, have different uh, views on that. But bottom line, the clothing um, is that you wear when you go out there to do that spray job is going to get material on it. It's designed to get material on it. And you'd rather have it on your clothes than on your skin. Contamination is inevitable, but it is definitely a very manageable thing. So let's talk about a handful of some common sense approach. First off, you need to review that pesticide label. It doesn't matter whether it's a professional or homeowner, you need to know what the obligations are in terms of washing work clothing. The other thing is, is handling the clothes, uh, making sure that those clothes are kept separate from the rest of the family laundry, storing those clothes if that happens um, away from the rest of the family laundry until they can be appropriately washed. And then we need to use good wash settings when we're washing these clothes. And I'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Decontaminating the washing machine is important, especially when uh, we have some really highly contaminated clothing. Now, I understand that um, some people don't go to that extra step, and it also depends on the amount of contaminants that you're working with. But generally speaking, you really should be looking at decontaminating the washing machine after you get through washing your uh, contaminated work clothes. If you work with commercial laundering firms, and many of my professional applicators do, we recommend that they visit with those firms so that they understand what they're working with. And then, uh, especially professionals, uh, we want them to visit with laundromats or co-ops, uh, a coin-operated uh, laundry facility so that they also know um, what they're doing out there in terms of using somebody else's equipment. It's really all about reducing residues in homes. So we want to do a good job cleaning up outside as best we can. And then if we have the ability to remove the clothes outside of the home, in other words, if you have a shop area or a workshop area uh, that you can change out or even a private secured porch area, that would be a good thing. If not, if you're gonna be changing those clothes out in the house, uh, try and uh, change them out in an area that can easily be wiped down or cleaned up. Contaminated clothes should be stored and washed separately from the household laundry. And that means putting it in a plastic garbage bag or a tote or something like that if you're gonna hold those clothes for very, very long after use. On the other hand, we'd really like you to wash your clothes just as soon as you can after 
you get through um, uh, using them. Because what we found in research is, is that the longer we wait, uh, the harder it is to get pesticide residues out of the clothes. And, uh, but if you do have to wait, we want you to store those clothes in a tote or a bag or something uh, that can easily be to decontaminated and keep them segregated from the rest of the fam family laundry. If you uh, need to store them, uh, it would be nice if you could store them on a porch or in a shop area or garage. Um, and then when you're loading up the washing machine, it would be great to minimize any kind of skin exposure uh, by wearing a long sleeve shirt or long pants uh, when loading that washing machine and gloves. Uh, now, I don't get as excited about this part of the, of the, the hygiene uh, situation because most of the contaminants that on that, those clothes are diluted pesticides. So the risk is not as great, but again, what we're trying to do is, is to reduce contaminants. So anything you can do to avoid getting that stuff on your skin would be a good idea. With respect to optimizing wash settings, you've got to read the manual for the washing machine that you're going to be working with. And I, I can't emphasize this enough because I know that when I sat down to uh, write up this publication, I read a number of manuals and I asked uh, Gail if she could provide me with a copy of the manual for our washing machine. And, uh, you know, I think we owned that machine for eight or nine years. I had never read the manual. And uh, just reading that manual will give you an enormous amount of information in order to get the most out of that washing machine. The other thing is, is don't overload the washing machine. Uh, make sure that your loads are not much more than 50 to 75 percent of wash capacity. The more you load that machine, the harder it is to get the dilution and the decontamination of your clothes. Use as much detergent as your uh, washing machine will handle. Uh, we don't want to use what we call gentle detergents, detergents that are uh, designed for baby fabrics or things like that. Um, we, we want to have good quality detergents um, so avoid the gentle stuff. Use hot water at the highest possible setting for your particular machine. That will maximize the dilution and improve uh, the uh, 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 cleaning of your clothes. Use a, a pre-rinse or pre-soak before you get into an aggressive wash cycle and, and use high-speed spins always, whether it's with the the, uh, uh, the rinse water or the, the final um, um, uh, spin cycle. The high speed spin will get a maximum amount of material out of the clothes and down into the, uh, into the sewer uh, so that they're no longer on your clothes. Uh, if you can, it would be swell if you could dry these clothes outside, but we all live in the uh, northern parts of the United States and that only works for a month or two out of the summer. And uh, of course, as, as we, uh, so many people have um, washers and dryers in their homes, very rarely are we seeing people close, put clothes out on a, on a line. But if you can, that would be a good thing. Um, run an additional empty cycle um, with soap, without clothes in your, in your uh, washing machine before you start using it for the rest of the family laundry. With respect to additives and detergents, um, the important thing here is, is that I don't think that you get any value. Uh, there's never been any research that indicates that these sorts of additives are gonna be a, a positive thing for re removing the contaminants out of the clothes. Now, if you have a need for it um, that is separate and different than the pesticides, I'm okay with that. It's just that don't be thinking you're going to get any additional value out of it. Now, we don't really know uh, the value or the merit associated with pouches or pods. Those are relatively new since the research has come out. Um, but uh, my suspicion is, is that they probably would be okay. I think the thing that is most important is, is that you develop a good uh, cleaning uh, regimen. And when you do that, 
I think uh, it's not as critical in your soap selection in terms of pod, liquid, or dry material, as long as it's good. So I want to talk about a couple of other points. This will inform you a little bit about the limitations of some of the work that was done back in the 80s and early 90s and how we're trying to address it moving forward. Most of the pesticides that were done in these research studies were much more toxic than the sorts of things that we're using today. Generally, these pesticides that we have today are lower toxicity and the amount of active ingredient in those materials are not nearly as high. Having said that, pesticides are still a risky thing. Um, manufacturers have done a really great job in terms of reducing uh, exposure, in terms of packaging and formulation. But again, pesticides are still risky. They can pose a health risk. And I think that anytime you can minimize exposure um, to yourself, uh, you're, you're going to be in much better place uh, in the long run. A good laundering routine is really what's critical here, um, even though we are working with less toxic pesticides than we had when this research came about. Detergents have changed an awfully lot over the last uh, several decades. Uh, we no longer have phosphates in our um, uh, detergents. Generally, they're much better, uh, the detergents we have now are much better at dissolving contaminants than in the olden days. Uh, they can tolerate hard water situations and uh, they just really are a much better product than they used to be. We're also using much uh, more liquids the liquids tend to go into solution some more. And the pods and pouches, while we don't have any research on them, these are highly concentrated formulations of either liquids or the dry formulations. They're in pouches and pods because they are so concentrated. And, uh, and my suspicion is, is that they would probably be uh, just fine. Again, it really comes back to developing a good routine, good procedures, and when you do that, I think uh, regardless of the soap, you'll be in good shape. This is the big one, and that is, is that washing machine design has changed radically over the last 25 or 30 years. And we're moving towards washing machines with digital control systems. Uh, my sister, this happens to be her washing machine. She's so very proud of it. She spent an enormous amount of money on this thing. I was a bit shocked when she told me but it's got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and it has all kinds of customizable controls. And it is absolutely mind-boggling, but what's really cool about it is we can set up all kinds of different programmable cycles and timelines in terms of how aggressive we want that wash cycle. I and mean, we could set up wash cycles that last for well over an hour just in the wash cycle alone. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that you wash your clothes for an hour um, in that wash cycle because you'll be wearing out your clothes. But certainly a nice aggressive wash for at least 20 minutes uh, would be really uh, excellent. Customizable spin settings. Again, I'm really big on um, very high spin settings. And then the rinse cycle duration and intensity. We can set up a couple of rinse cycles if we want. And we can have those rinse cycles go on for a much longer period of time um, and all of those things we have the capacity to do with these new washing machines. Steam assisted clothing, cleaning, cleaning is something that commercial laundries uh, only had the ability to do, but um, we're seeing that being made available to uh, a typical homeowner out there. We don't know how valuable it is, but we think that it would be helpful. We also don't know about some of the newer washing machine designs, the front or top load machines, uh, with, without agitators, um, there isn't a great deal of research work that was done in those particular areas. A couple of items that, other items that I want to share, the superheated uh, heating coils that are found in these new washing machines that will uh, take the hot water from your tap, run it up to 155 or 60 degrees. We think that that would be helpful, but we don't know exactly how helpful that would be. The older machines will work just fine. I don't think any of you need to rush out there and buy a new washing machine to properly wash your clothes. 
The point I'll make here is, is that the simple washing machines require, um, if you want soak cycles, rinse cycles, all those sorts of things, you may have to do a manual reset in order to get the setting that you want. And unfortunately, we all know how it works. The phone rings, uh, one of the kids is, uh, uh, needs your attention on some particular problem and you get distracted and you forget where you're at and that washing machine continues to go through the normal paces. And when it does, you don't have the ability to intervene and most people will not do anything other than just pull the clothes out and put them in the washing machine, into the dryer. Uh, they're not going to go start at, at ground zero again. Uh, the other problem that we see uh, is in a water and energy conservation. These are becoming much more of a problematic area, especially on the West Coast. Uh, water and energy conservation are becoming more important all the time. Uh, I always tell people, obviously, um, minimize your exposure. That's a, a good thing anytime. Uh, maximize your efficiency. In other words, you can go with a little bit heavier load capacity. We don't want you to go above 75, but if you're going to hold clothes for a couple days, that may be self-defeating because we want you to wash those things as soon as you can after, uh, after you uh, get changed out of your clothes. Um, the other thing is, is we think that we may be able to get by with longer wash cycles and rinse cycles at cooler temperatures, um, but we don't know that. There hasn't been any research done on it to date. The other one is, is these new fabrics and finishes. All the things that I've been talking about today are based on research that was done many, many years ago, and nothing has been done with the newer fabrics. Everything is with your cottons and your polyesters some of your other fabrics like rayons and things like that that have been around for a lot a while. But these new breathable fabrics, there hasn't been any work done in those areas. Uh, I recommend that you at least visit with your supplier or manufacturer to make sure that uh, whatever you do in terms of washing doesn't um, adversely affect the clothing. Um, and the other thing is, is we have in our house uh, washed a number of uh, garments over the last several years of some of these breathable fabrics. Uh, they tend to stand up fairly well to, uh, to uh, some of the wash protocols that we, we've been talking about. I haven't seen any adverse impacts on the clothing, but we also don't know how good of a job we're doing extracting the pesticides from those newer fabrics. We think it's probably going to be okay but uh, we don't have any uh, good information in those areas. So I would invite you to download and print out a copy of this publication, Wandering Pesticide Contaminated Clothing. It's also a tiny URL, uh, NDSU-PS1778. Um, and I, I think that all of the details that I've talked about here over the last few minutes will be there and should be helpful to you. And I would highly recommend that you share it with any friends or anybody else that may be working with pesticides and uh, make sure that uh, when you get done at the end of the day, you get out of those work clothes, get into a shower and make sure that those clothes get handled appropriately. And with that, Stacy, I am done. And we've got a few minutes to be able to visit with folks. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce out of my presentation and go back to a headshot, okay? Perfect. Um, if you have any questions, please either place them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. So I want to stop the share. Yep. And I'm back to me. And... Um, so uh, Stacy, uh, if you want to handle any kind of mutes or any kind of chats that people have and feed those to me, I'll do my best to be able to answer them, okay? Yep. Um, and Sherry, we will put all of the links that Andrew talked about um, in the email coming to you after the webinar. Right. Any Question. other questions? All right, so I see some chat questions on there and I, 
I'm, I apologize. Scary. I have to wear my glasses to see what's going on. But I was looking to see if anybody's chatting yeah. to you privately, but they didn't. Yeah, and they're and they're putting the uh, they they are going to be posting the links for you all, and uh, you know I I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but I'm telling you that the materials that we have will go into much more detail in things that I think you can use uh, in your uh, in a day to day use of pesticides. All right, if there are no questions, you must have covered, done a really nice job. <laughs> all right, well, I just want to thank uh, uh, Stacy, you and your crew for getting all this set up. Uh, they will be uh, putting together the archive of this and making that available to folks that couldn't have participated in this today. I also want to uh, thank uh, uh, Mary Coley with uh, University of Arkansas uh, Extension uh, for her help and for the generous use of their studio and making me look great uh, and sounding great. And um, by the way, Stacy or Julie or any of you NDSU types, we have to get one of these systems. Uh, <laughs> I was just get, thinking that. Yeah, yeah, we are going to get one of these. Mark my words. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a great day. All right. Thank you all. Take care.